In 2019, Rich Sutton, a pioneer of reinforcement learning, authored a short essay entitled The Bitter Lesson that characterizes a particular viewpoint on the development of AI, and it is a view that extends to computer vision. This view is that general methods that leverage computation are ultimately the most effective. There is perhaps no architecture that better embodies this perspective than transformers. If we were to consider handcrafted features such as SIF and CNNs, we can place each of these approaches on a scale in terms of how much we have deliberately built inductive biases into the model. Handcrafted features make heavy use of human knowledge and hard-coded inductive biases. CNNs shift much of the burden away from humans and onto automatically learned features, but still enforce some inductive biases with properties like translation invariance. Transformers remove even more of the inductive biases built into the model. You can think of them as being the most data-driven architecture. In this video, we'll look at the motivation behind designing new architectures, where transformers come from, and how they work. Let's first talk about why we care about neural network architectures. By way of background, modern deep learning stems from connectionism, where it has long been believed that focusing on the wiring of the network is the way to go for building intelligent machines. It's helpful to categorize the kinds of wiring that occur between neural network units into two categories. The network architecture, this is loosely speaking, the connections between units that are typically fixed throughout training. For example, whether two units are connected by convolution or max pooling, and network parameters, the connections between units that are updated during training, such as the convolutional kernel weights which are typically learned via SGD and backpropagation. Neural network architecture design focuses primarily on finding good network architectures. Though, as you can probably see, the distinction between what defines the architecture and what defines the parameters can be slightly blurry. When thinking about the goals of network architectures, it's worth reminding ourselves that we inhabit a resource-limited environment. We have limited supplies of energy, computation, memory, and time. Typically, what we want from our architectures is the greatest possible task performance, for example accuracy, at an acceptable resource burden. It's no good designing a neural network architecture that we can't actually run on our computers. However, a key point to note here is that, thanks to Moore's law, the rise of GPUs, and other hardware-related factors, what constitutes an acceptable resource burden changes over time. Among many proposals, the architecture that has risen to dominance in recent years is the Transformer, which was introduced in a paper with the catchy title Attention is All You Need in June 2017 by researchers based at Google. The paper targeted the field of natural language processing, and the task that they primarily focused on was machine translation, for example, translating English to German. While it steadily gathered momentum among NLP researchers, it was not until three years later when another paper from Google explored transformers for computer vision, that they were really adopted into the computer vision community. Their variant is helpfully called vision transformers, which you will see abbreviated to VITs. I am dramatically oversimplifying here. There were in fact several other innovative efforts to use transformers in vision, particularly in object detection, but VITs have been particularly influential. Now, if transformers are so great, it's interesting to ask why it took three years to really make the jump from NLP to computer vision, which is quite a long time in the modern era. Second, why was it Google that demonstrated the benefits of transformers for vision? Of course, we cannot know for sure, but by the end of this video, I hope it will become clear why the nature of transformers made this more probable than otherwise. Okay, so what is a transformer? If you go back and read the Attention is All You Need paper, you'll be confronted with this colourful but nevertheless still intimidating diagram. The first thing you will observe is that it seems to have two main parts to it, one on the left and one on the right. These two parts are known as the encoder and the decoder. The encoder on the left learns to map inputs to useful representations for whatever task is being performed. The decoder on the right learns to decode the encoded representations and combines them with other inputs to make sequence predictions. Now, somewhat confusingly, there are three popular variants, and all of them are interchangeably referred to as transformers. There are encoder-only models, which throw away the decoder and are primarily useful for learning representations of the input. If you've ever heard of the BERT architecture in NLP, this is an example of an encoder-only model. Then there are decoder-only models, which throw away the encoder and are particularly useful for generation tasks. Perhaps the best known example here is GPT-3, 
a precursor to the foundation of the ChatGPT system. And finally, there is the encoder-decoder architecture, useful for sequence-to-sequence -sequence tasks like machine translation. This was popularized by the OG Transformer, but is now perhaps the least widely used architecture in practice. Okay, now we've seen the Transformer at an abstract level, but to make it a bit more concrete, let's see how it is applied to computer vision. The vision transformer architecture I mentioned earlier is an example of an encoder-only model, so there is no decoder involved. When we want to process an image, the first thing we do is to slice it up into square patches. Then we flatten these patches into a one-dimensional sequence. Next, we apply a linear projection to each patch to map them to some desired dimensionality. Now. One issue with splitting up our image into a 1D sequence, apart from being visually displeasing for computer vision researchers who are mostly unhappy with doing anything in fewer than two dimensions, is that the transformer has no way of telling which patch came from which location in the image. The trick here is to add some extra information to each patch embedding to signify where the patch came from in the input. This extra information is called a position embedding. It's represented here by the purple numbers 1 up to 9. One additional detail is that VIT also uses a trick from NLP where one extra learnable embedding, often called the class token, is also included as an input and assigned position zero in the sequence. Now we can pass our sequence of embeddings into a transformer encoder so it can do its transformery magic. Last, we pluck out the embedding from the zeroth position and pass it through an MLP. This MLP is then used to predict the class of the image. Simple. Of course, the big question is now, what is going on inside this big grey box labelled transformer encoder? Starting from the embedded patches, the encoder consists of a stack of transformer blocks, one on top of the other. In this diagram, information flows upwards. There are five key ideas we need to grok to understand how this works. The first is the multi-head attention block for which transformers are famous. The second is the multi-layer perceptron, which appears a little further up. Roughly speaking, the multi-head attention lets the different patch embeddings communicate with each other, while the MLP lets each embedding think independently about what it has just learned from its neighbors. There is no information sharing between patches here. These two blocks are the compute heavy blocks. They are where pretty much all of the floating point horsepower goes. Next, we have two blocks that are included to help the optimization process. The first takes the form of residual connections and the second takes the form of layer normalization. Each appears twice. Roughly speaking, residual connections help gradients flow while layer normalization aims to stabilize learning. Finally, outside the encoder itself, as I mentioned previously, we also add positional embeddings to the embedded patches. This is done at the input and helps the transformer identify which patch embedding comes from which location. We'll first look at attention in the simplified single head setting, starting with the input to the attention block, which consists of n embeddings with dimension d. In the vision transformer we just saw, n is equal to the number of patches plus 1 where the plus one accounts for the glass token. I've colorfully illustrated this for n equals three and d equals two. The first thing we do, before anything else, is to stack the embeddings into an n by d matrix so that we can process it efficiently. Now, the problem that attention aims to solve is the following. How can we allow the n embeddings to communicate with each other so that they can share useful information? To explain why communication is important, let's suppose you are an embedding of this image patch. Now, what do you think this patch is a picture of? Of course, it's an eye. But since you're ultimately going to want to produce features that encode the meaning of the full image, you want to know what kind of animal it belongs to. It might be a dog or a cat or possibly some other mammal. One strategy is to ask the other patch embeddings what they are encoding. Now suppose another patch tells you that it's encoding some long strands of hair like this. Now. Hopefully it's clear that you are looking at a lion. Communication let you resolve the ambiguity. Here is the original image for completeness. A handsome fellow. The way we achieve this communication is with a clever idea. We project each patch embedding three separate times to produce queries, keys, and values. For each patch embedding, these new projections can be thought of as having particular meanings. The queries represent, roughly speaking, here's what I'm looking for. The keys represent, roughly speaking, Here's what I have, and the values are what actually gets communicated. Now we have to somehow turn this intuition into linear algebra so we can include it in our neural network. 
This is done by learning three matrices, one to produce the queries, one to produce the keys, and one to produce the values. Here, dk is the dimension of the queries and keys, and dv is the dimension of the values. We can then multiply the original embeddings x by wq to get the queries q, by wk to get the keys k, and by wv to get the values v. We are now in a position to compute what is called scaled dot product attention. Here is the formula. There's a lot going on, so let's break it down. The real magic is happening here, when we multiply Q by K transpose. This is an N by N matrix, where each row contains the similarities from the query of one embedding, i.e. what it's looking for, to the keys of all the other embeddings, which say what they have. The softmax is applied along the rows of the matrix to normalize them to probability vectors. Now, if you've worked with a softmax, you'll know that it's a sensitive soul that doesn't like to give useful gradients when one input is much bigger than the others. So we also divide by the square root of the dimension of the keys to avoid peaky affinities when the inner products are large. The justification for this normalization constant is that if we assume we have query and key vectors q and k that are independent random variables with mean zero and variance one, then their inner product has a variance that is the same as the key dimension. That can cause the magnitudes to get very big for high dimensions, which in turn saturates the softmax and ruins the gradients. If this assumption is approximately correct, then normalizing by the square root of dk will keep the variance around 1. Finally, the v at the end here allows us to use our softmaxed matrix to compute a weighted sum of the values. Effectively, each embedding gets a weighted sum of the values of the other embeddings according to the query key similarity. The attention mechanism we've described so far is useful, but what if the patches want to send multiple messages? The solution proposed by the original authors is to perform multiple attention operations in parallel. Okay, prepare your brain. We will use a collection of H separate attention heads. Then, for each of the H heads, we use a separate learned query matrix to produce the queries, a separate learned key matrix to produce the keys, and a separate learned value matrix to produce the values, and we apply scaled dot product attention, just as before, to produce an output. Once we finish doing this for all H heads, we concatenate the results together and apply a final projection to ensure we end up with the right dimensionality. This for loop may seem somewhat slow and complicated, but in practice, each attention head can be executed in parallel, so it's pretty fast. In fact, with clever tensor indexing, all of these separate multiplications can be achieved very efficiently with batched matrix multiplication, which is an operation that is extremely well optimized in modern frameworks like PyTorch and JAX when executed on accelerators like GPUs or TPUs. One extra note here. Typically, for multi-head attention, we make the head dimension smaller. We often pick the head dimension to be the original embedding dimension divided by the number of heads, so the total cost of multi-head attention is similar to the cost of single-head attention if we ignore the final projection matrix. One final point to note here is that the asymptotic complexity of multi-head attention, if we ignore the projections, is big O of n squared times d. This means that the cost of attention is quadratic in the sequence length. This is a big deal. Many Many researchers have proposed ways to reduce this complexity, but so far, at least as far as I know, no one has proposed a model that reliably outperforms vanilla transformers at scale. Okay, jumping back to our transformer encoder block, we've seen how multi-head attention, which is arguably the most complex part, is implemented. We'll next look at the MLP, the second computationally heavy block. Now that our embeddings have shared their thoughts with each other, we'd like them to do some thinking alone about what they've learned. We achieve this with a two-layer MLP that is applied independently on each embedding, which looks like this. We have a linear layer, then a non-linearity, which I've denoted sigma, then a second linear layer. The original transformer used ReLU for its non-linearity. More recently, GELU has become a little more popular. These non-linearities are fairly similar shapes, except that the GELU is a little smoother near the origin. When we implement the MLP, it's typical to use an expansion factor of 4. This is a value that was determined to work well empirically. That means that when we start from a d-dimensional embedding, we first multiply by a short and wide matrix, W1, which increases dimensionality by a factor of 4. Then we apply a non-linearity, like GELU, which keeps the same dimension, then we multiply by a second matrix, which brings the dimensionality back down to D. Simple. Okay, so back to our transformer block. Let's talk next about residual connections. 
these arrows going around the side. Residual connections help with optimization. They are very simple to implement. For the first part of the block, this red arrow corresponds to simply adding the input back to the result of applying normalization and multi-head attention. And again, for the second part of the transformer block, the residual corresponds to simply adding the input back to the output. Now, why does this help optimization? The correct answer here is a shrugging emoji followed by muttering something about deep learning. The original authors hypothesize that it is easier to optimize the residual mapping than to optimize the original unreferenced mapping. This basically amounts to the claim that it is easier to model a perturbation to the identity function than a generic input-output mapping. It certainly is true that, empirically, residual connections make a big difference to optimization. In fact, learning deep networks without residual connections is pretty difficult. There are two widely cited intuitions for why residuals help. The first is that they help with gradient flow and in particular with the vanishing gradients problem. This is a problem you can run into if you perform many consecutive matrix multiplies in a row, and it used to be a major issue when training your networks. A second intuition is that they help with preconditioning. This is effectively the intuition described by the original authors. You initialize the learning problem using the identity function in a way that makes it easier to learn. To give you a sense of just how widely used residual connections are, the Google Scholar page for the paper that introduced them has, at the last time of checking, almost 190,000 citations. I believe this makes it one of the most cited papers of all time in any field of science. We're now ready for the last pieces of the puzzle that fall inside the transformer encoder, the two layer norm blocks that appear before the multi-head attention and before the MLP. Layer norm is very similar to batch norm. In both cases, we normalize inputs by subtracting their mean and dividing by the square root of the variance, plus some positive constant offset for numerical stability. To avoid losing expressiveness, we scale the result by a learned gain parameter and add on a learned bias parameter. The difference between layer norm and batch norm comes in how we estimate the mean and variance of the inputs. To explain the difference, we're going to need to prepare our n-dimensional brain. So far, we've discussed processing n by d matrices like this, where n is the sequence length, i.e. the number of image patches plus one, and d is the embedding dimension. However, for optimization and efficiency reasons, we actually process 3D tensors of size b by n by d, where b is the mini-batch size. Here is a visualization of a b by d by n tensor. In batch norm, we estimate the mean and variance along the batch dimension. Although batch norm isn't commonly used in sequence models like transformers, when it is, it is typical to include the sequence length dimension also when computing statistics. In layer norm, on the other hand, we compute statistics only along the embedding dimension. This means that layer norm has no dependence on the batch dimension, so the prediction for an instance doesn't depend on the composition of its particular mini-batch. It also has the benefit that we can use the same procedure at training and test time, so we don't need to mess around with running averages as we do in batch norm. That avoids a lot of bugs. Earlier, I mentioned a fifth component that goes into building transformers. That fifth component is position embeddings. Rather than appearing in the transformer encoder, these come into play after we split the image into patches and projected them. They are embeddings that we add to the projected patches before they enter the encoder. The motivation here is that each of the operations we've seen in the transformer encoder treats its inputs as a set. It doesn't care about ordering. If you permute the input embeddings, you'd simply permute the outputs. That's an issue because once we've split the images into patches, we've thrown away their relative positions. The solution that has been proposed to address this is to use position embeddings that label each patch with its position, so the transformer knows what it's looking at. For instance, the position embedding would tell the transformer that when it is looking at this patch embedding, it is in fact looking at the top left patch from the image. Similarly, each other patch is labeled in some unique way that tells the transformer encoder where in the image it came from. The question then, of course, is how do we label positions in a way that the transformer can easily understand? The original transformer paper proposed to use handcrafted position embeddings. There are many schemes you can use here. The basic requirement is that the embedding uniquely identifies the position of an input in a sequence. They created vectors for each element in the sequence based on sines and cosines of different wavelengths. To convey the idea, here's a plot showing four different sine and cosine waves. 
though in practice many more are used. To label the tenth element in the sequence, which is about here on the x-axis, you create a vector containing the value of each of these waves. And to label the thirtieth element in the sequence, which is about here, you create another vector with the value of each of these waves at this position. These wave values uniquely identify positions in the sequence. The original transformer authors found sines and cosines to work as well as other alternatives, and suggested that using sines and cosines may allow the model to learn how to extrapolate positions. The VIT authors simply learned the positional embeddings from scratch. Positional embeddings are an active area of research. Before discussing results, I'd like to describe two variants of attention that are not used in vision transformers, but are present in the original transformer and are widely used in other settings. So far, the queries, keys and values have been produced from the same sequence. This is known as self-attention. There's also another alternative form of attention known as cross-attention, where queries come from one sequence and keys and values come from a different sequence. In the transformer, cross-attention is used here, with the keys and values coming from the encoder and the queries coming from the decoder. In the context of English to French machine translation, the decoder is generating the next token in the French output sentence, and this cross-attention lets it look at all the tokens in the English input sentence. Cross-attention is also used in computer vision in the Flamingo architecture from DeepMind, in which a language decoder uses cross-attention to attend to visual inputs from an encoder. Another kind of attention used in a decoder, but also not in VIT, relates to scenarios when we are generating output sequences. Intuitively, when generating output sequences one element at a time, we don't want all embeddings to communicate. If I'm generating a sequence of words in a sentence, I can't allow each word to depend on future words since they haven't been generated yet. This can be addressed by only allowing what's called causal attention, which appears in the transformer diagram as the masked multi-head attention block here. From a coding perspective, this is surprisingly simple to implement. You simply mask your n by n query key attention matrix, keeping everything in the lower triangle and setting everything above the diagonal to negative infinity. When you pass the result through the softmax, it will turn each negative infinity into a zero, so the current position receives no information from future positions. Next, I'd like to talk a little bit about scaling phenomena and the role of hardware in the deep learning era. There was a nice piece of analysis conducted by Amade and Hernandez in 2018 which looked at how the compute usage used to train the largest neural networks has changed over time. They noticed two regimes, a first era, shown here, up until around 2012, in which the computational resources used for training runs had grown roughly in line with Moore's law, a two-year doubling. Then they observed a second era, from 2012 onwards, during which compute usage for the largest models has doubled approximately every 3.4 months. The measurement unit here on the y-axis is petaflop per second days, which corresponds to approximately the computational resources of running 8 V100 GPUs for a day. Since that last plot is slightly old, here's an updated plot from Epoch AI released a few weeks ago. It includes the original 1957 Perceptron, the 2017 Transformer used for machine translation, and the largest publicly known training run to date, which is GPT-4. The analysts estimate that GPT-4 uses nearly eight orders of magnitude more compute than AlexNet, the model that kicked off the modern deep learning era for computer vision. That corresponds to nearly 100 million times more compute, such as the modern era. It's then worth asking what factors are enabling teams to scale up their effective compute for these larger models. One analysis, conducted in 2020, suggests that a factor of 37,500 growth has come from increased spending and parallelization across machines. A further factor of 8 has come from Moore's Law, and a factor of 25 has come from improved algorithmic efficiency. Roughly speaking, we can say that most of the scaling is coming from hardware, but that improved algorithms are also contributing to gains in effective compute. Many proxies could be used for estimating effective compute available to researchers. In this study, the authors compare experiments in terms of the number of floating point operations required to reach AlexNet level ImageNet performance. To provide a rough ballpark figure of where we are up to today, the cost of training the GPT-4 model was reported to be on the order of 100 million US dollars. Whenever the question of scaling and hardware and finances comes up, it's worth asking, is this important? Is it just engineering, a phrase you may hear uttered, or is it something more fundamental? 
When considering this question, it can be helpful to note that it is a long-standing challenge of scientific research to analyse shifts from quantitative to qualitative differentiation. This idea can seem a little abstract, so to make it more concrete, you might try asking yourself, is cell biology just applied molecular biology? Is molecular biology just applied chemistry? Is chemistry just applied many-body physics? And so on. In each case, it is fair to say that one science obeys the laws of the other, but at each scale of study, new laws and concepts are also necessary, which make the research qualitatively different. This tension between qualitative and quantitative differences is eloquently captured in literature, in a slightly editorialised rendition of the writing of Fitzgerald, who observes that the rich are different from us, and then by the response from Hemingway, yes, they have more money. This is not necessarily a suggestion to embroil yourself in the world of hardware accelerators, but I would highlight, if it's not already familiar, a quote by Richard Hamming on the influence of computing speed, which I consider to be particularly salient. In almost all fields, a factor of 10 means fundamentally new effects. If you increase magnification by a factor of 10 in biology, you will see new things. Faster computers change the nature of the field and the properties that emerge. So from this perspective, scale is fundamental and it's worth thinking carefully about. Now, how does all this talk of scaling link back to the transformer architecture? An interesting property of transformers is that they appear to exhibit predictable scaling. In particular, it has been shown that on language modeling tasks, performance scales predictably as a power law function of compute, training data size, and model size. If you plot loss, so lower is better, against the number of tokens used in the training set for a range of different model sizes, performance seems to vary smoothly across dataset size and model size. In fact, some power laws were found that appear to span more than six orders of magnitude across these dimensions, which shows remarkable predictability. The authors found that, intriguingly, while it mattered how many parameters you had in total, it mattered less how you arranged them. You can have deeper and narrower transformers, with many layers, or shallower and wider transformers with fewer layers, and within a fairly wide range of configurations, you get similar performance. A couple of other intriguing characteristics of transformers are worth being aware of. The first is that larger models require fewer samples to reach the same performance. Here we have a graph with tokens processed on the x-axis and test loss on the y-axis. This might seem quite counterintuitive, given that we might think models with fewer parameters can adjust more quickly to training data. A related observation relates how to deploy your available compute budget when training a transformer to get the best possible performance. In this work, the authors found that significant computation should be devoted to increasing the model size, and a relatively small amount of computation should go into increasing the amount of data. The takeaway is that if extra compute is available, we should allocate most of it towards increasing the model size. Some later work from DeepMind reached broadly similar conclusions, but places much more emphasis on increasing the training dataset size relative to the model size. So far, we've been talking about scaling transformers in the context of natural language processing. Let's return to computer vision and the vision transformer. One reason that this work has become so influential is its interesting finding on the importance of pre-training scale. The VIT authors conducted experiments which pre-trained a number of different models on three different datasets and then evaluated how well they transferred to the ImageNet benchmark. Specifically, they trained a strong CNN baseline, known as BIT, and then a range of vision transformer models with different model capacities and patch sizes. The increasing circle sizes here indicate the increasing computational complexity of the models. In the diagram, the upper grey line shows the performance of a larger CNN baseline, while the lower grey line shows the performance of a smaller CNN baseline. When training on ImageNet, 1.3 million labelled images, vision transformers are fairly underwhelming and lag behind the BIT CNN. But something interesting happens when we train on the 14 million labelled images of ImageNet 21K. Suddenly, the transformers have become competitive. And if we go further and train on the 303 million labelled images of JFT300M, vision transformers begin to look like a superior choice. In fact, the largest transformer outperforms the largest CNN model which previously represented the state of the art. One way to interpret this result is that in the lower data regime, the stronger inductive biases of the CNN work better. These include properties like locality and translation invariance. But in the higher data regime, particularly JFT300M, the vision transformer starts to shine. This partly explains why it was Google who made the discovery. 
Not many researchers have a 300 million image labelled dataset lying around and enough hardware to run experiments at this scale, at least not back in 2021. I'll wrap up with one other observation relating to vision transformers. It appears that when given enough pre-training data, the earlier attention layers in a VIT are able to learn to act locally, just like a CNN kernel that only looks at a local neighbourhood. Here's a plot where the blue lines are attention layers early in the network and the green lines are attention layers later in the network. The y-axis shows how far away the attention mechanisms are looking. We see from the gap on the left that some early layer attention heads are looking very locally. Let's contrast that to pre-training on 1 million images from ImageNet, where we see that the mean attention distance, even for earlier layers, remains pretty high. The attention is always global. This is intriguing because it suggests that large-scale pre-training allows vision transformers to get the best of both worlds. They can learn local features that are robust for most use cases, but also learn global features for the rarer cases when those are useful to include early in the network. In the video description, you can find links to slides and references. I hope you have a wonderful day.